Welcome out to On The Money. I want to remind uh, everybody before we get into this, uh, if you uh, want to catch or do any one-on-one -on -one sessions, the, the OYART Mentoring Cafe is, is uh, right out inside there, and it's, uh, it's gratis. Make sure you get your time with these people one-on-one. -on -one. It's what Canadian mu Music Week is all about. Uh, before things got so multi-layered, the revenue streams for musicians were pretty well-defined. Today, however, new ways of making money for your music seem to be popping up every week. How can you make yourself aware of these opportunities and access money? It's the topic of the next presentation. To speak on the subject, we are pleased to have the co-director of the Future of Music Coalition in the house this morning. Please welcome Kristen Thompson. Wow, I got, I got a cheering section, that's awesome. So thank you so much, and thank you to Neil and Kat for um, inviting us here to take part in the 30th annual CMW. It's so exciting, and congratulations. My name is Kristen Thompson, and I'm, um, I've been with the Future of Music Coalition since it started about 11 years ago. Um, FMC is a US-based nonprofit that advocates for musicians. And um, in those past 11 years, it's been pretty amazing to see all these things that have happened. Um, the array of technologies and services that have been developed to help musicians create, promote, and sell their music, connect with fans, many of them created by people who are here at CMW and other conferences. Um, so many are quick to categorize these technological and, and sort of structural changes as a good thing for musicians. And I would agree that a lot of them <clears throat> have really made it vastly easier for musicians to enter and access and take, engage in the marketplace. But um, there's something that's less clear, and that's how these changes have actually impacted their ability to make a living and earn money um, doing their craft. So that's what I've been doing for the past year and a half. Um, we've been trying to figure this out. So we've been, <clears throat> I'm the co-director of a, re a research project called Artist Revenue Streams. It's a multi-method, cross-genre examination of how US-based musician and composers or revenue streams are changing and why. Um, so some in the audience might think that, think that this kind of research is kind of re you know, redundant, unnecessary. We are awash in data on a daily basis, whether it's Nielsen reports or social media reporting or the number of Twitter followers you have. But this is very different than the other statistics you can get on a daily basis. It's, it's not about market share. It's not about your social graph. It's about um, measuring, a, it's a benchmarking effort to measure how much uh, are individual musicians making. It's about what they end up putting in their pocket and how it's changing over time. And to here's how we did it. Um, to understand how musicians and composers are making money, the only way to do it is to ask them directly. And we did that through three different methods. We did in-person interviews. We did about 80 of those over the past year and a half. We've done some financial case studies. We've published five of them. We have four more probably on the way. And we did a wide-ranging online survey last fall that about 5,000 musicians and composers responded to. And it is US-based. Um, so it's really interesting. I mean, sorry, I should mention that um, this is the sort of huge batch of revenue streams we're talking about. In the introduction, they, there was sort of a, a brief mention of the fact that there's a lot of them, and in fact, there are. I mean, we had to group them by category. <laughs> so we had eight categories by the sort of um, role that they play, because there's these contours of copyright law and business practice that determine who can make money according to different roles that you play and things that you do. So we had a bucket for composing, money made from compositions or money made by composers. We had a bucket for people who are performers, and we actually split the performance stuff in two because salaried orchestra players and salaried people tend to think of themselves not as just performers, but as salaried people. And so we kept those separate. Then there's money to be made from the sound recording or from the recording artists themselves. In the United States, we have a couple that aren't even here in Canada. Um, for example, the Sound Exchange digital performance royalties on the sound recording. Then there's also session work, people who are hired to play or in the studio or uh, on the road. We also were tracking money related to your brand, things you can make from your merchandise, your persona. And then we also were counting teaching. And then we had a bucket called Other that had about 20 other different revenue streams in it that um, you can see on our website. In fact, um, this is the 
website for the project, money.futuremusic.org, but we also have a page that uh, details all 42 revenue streams that we were looking at that you can look at, and everyone has sort of a drop-down toggle that describes the revenue stream in detail, how much it's paid and um, who's, who's, uh, who's, who it applies to. So just for today's presentation, I thought I'd highlight three specific things, because we have so much data, so much that we could talk about, and we've been releasing papers and stuff on very specific topics, but for today, since only, we only have a few minutes, I thought I'd pick three interesting things. So, number one, question, what do musicians' wages look like? Which is a really important question, because it's sort of core to the research we were doing. And a little survey snapshot. So, a little bit about the survey respondents. There were over 5,000 US-based musicians and composers who responded to the survey, which is a really great number. It's a lot of data. Of those people, about 40% spend more than 36 hours a week doing their craft. So we consider them, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much your full-time job if you're spending that much time on it. The genres that answered the survey, classical, predominated, but we also had jazz and rock and alternative rock, and then a huge list b below this that of all other genres that were represented or people who self-identified under other genres. Of all the survey respondents, 42% earn all of their money from music, and their personal gross income for this batch of survey respondents was 55,000 US dollars. Now, this number is actually, could include other things beyond what they do with music. Like, it could be another job, it could be investment money, it could be whatever. But um, because we asked about how much time they spend, I mean, what percent of their money comes from music and how much they make, we could also calculate their average estimated music income and for this big group, the aggregated number is about $34,000. There's a little number below that. The Bureau of Labor Statistics number shows that um, the average US individual is about 39000 So they're kind of in the middle, you know. Um, you also might be interested in to know just how many hats they're wearing. I mean, we've, I think at a conference like this, you tend to understand that there's a lot of different ways that musicians can make money, and in fact, there are now more and more responsibilities that people have if they're doing this stuff. And this, this chart shows that um, only 983 people just do one thing. You know, like, I'm just a composer. I'm just a performer. I'm just a teacher. The rest of them ha are playing more than one role. They might be a composer plus a performer. They might be a composer plus a session person. Um, so you can see that um, more than half of the respondents are doing three roles or more. But let's look at that first bar, the 983. What are those people that are just doing, making all their money from one thing? What are they doing? So live performance wins in this one, but then the next one down is below is being a salaried player. That makes sense. If you're a salaried player in an orchestra, that's probably your sole source of income. And you could see that in the case study we did about an orchestral player. So I think it's fair to say that musicians are part of the working middle class but they're wearing a lot of hats. Um, of course, there's some who make much, much more than this $39,000, um, and congratulations to them. But we should all remind ourselves that there are very few musicians who break through to those upper echelons of income, and that there's just essentially an army of working musicians out there that are middle class. And they're making, it, they're making a career out of music um, through, through various means. So let's look at another point. Um, something that we've certainly seen in the work we've done is that for people who perform, for musicians who perform, income from performances is critical, um, with four caveats. So, 58% of survey respondents said they made some money from shows in the past 12 months. And of about 2,000 survey respondents, 40% played more than 50 shows last year. That's not too bad. Um, so, the percent of the income from performance, if we aggregate all those 5,300 people, 28% of all of their income aggregated in the past 12 months came from live performances. So it's the biggest pie slice. But we also remember, ask about salaried performers separately because they think of themselves separately. So 19% of the aggregated income of all these 5,300 people came from being a salaried player. So if you put them together, which makes sense, it's both, they're both activities based on performance, 46% of the money earned in the past year from all of these 5,300 people came from live performance. So you can see it's really critical. 
And remember that the survey wasn't the only thing, only way we collected data. We also were doing interviews. And a chamber music group that we talked to underscored how important it was to them. It's, you know, the critical part of their revenue stream. But here's the first caveat. Touring costs money. And this should be really obvious, but sometimes it gets sort of shoved to the side when, the, when we're talking about money because we talk about the tour grosses, but sometimes the tour expenses eat up all of the <laughs> tour grosses. So um, just to show you an example, here's a, case, a slide from one of our case studies, um, a chamber music group. So, so they tour, they play a lot. That dark blue bar is their, their performance money. But you can see from the, at the bottom, the expenses associated with touring are also quite significant. And same with a jazz band leader, the blue bar again, live performance. But there's significant costs going out <coughs> and going out and playing. The other thing that's probably clear on this one, touring costs are not scalable, um, which underscores that unlike other, some other revenue streams, like those derived from making recordings or compositions, touring costs aren't very scalable. The more shows you play, the more money you spend, unless you set up a residency somewhere. When you can see artists doing that more and more often. Um, we talked to a hip hop manager who, who said that there's now an expectation that production and show costs are, the, the show has to be good, and that the costs associated have gone up simultaneously. Another caveat, live performance requires constant output. Um, touring, unlike the money you make off of sound recordings or compositions, to make the money as a performer, you need to perform. And a rock band guitarist we talked to summed it up really well. Touring has given him a middle class living, but if he stops tomorrow, the cash flow stops too. And the fourth caveat, not all musicians are performers, and I think this is really important for us to remember because there's so many assumptions made that, oh, you know, bands just make money off of, off of touring. Who cares if they're selling records or not? Well, there's, not, there's a whole bunch of musicians out there who don't tour. They're professional songwriters who write for other people. They're composers who compose for chamber music or orchestras. There are people who compose just for film and TV. And in our interview process, we try to actually we seek out those types of people who do not perform. We interviewed some people who are doing those roles. Um, and their livelihood is much more dependent on the contours of copyright law and business practice, on public performance royalties, licenses, commissions, grants, and mechanical royalties. So I only have three slides of composer data, but I thought you might show, show them to you. So just not that we don't have the data, we just haven't processed it yet. So of the that big aggregate number, 5,300 folks, 6% of the income of the aggregate was generated from licensing or performances or compositions last year. But what if we look at people who self-identified as composers in the survey? Then, if there are people who said there, I'm a member of a composer group, I'm a member of ASCAP or BMI, CSAC, um, um, Songwriters Guild of America, National Songwriters Association, American Composers Forum, or Meet the Composer, which was 1,966 people, their, their revenue stream, is 14% of it, is based on compositions. And then we had another one who, we had another cut at this that we identified composers who were also making 90% of their income from music and, um, and spending, uh, no, had more than 20 compositional credits in their lifetime. 27% of their income comes from compositions. We have a ton more data about compositions we're gonna be releasing in a paper in May um, that'll just focus on that. So, it's uh, just to point out, you know, that composition money is revenue that pays off year after year because it's money that um, you, there's an upfront investment, but then as it gets licensed and used over and over again, there's money that flows back to the composer. And just as a note, our indie rock composer represents that really well, that red bar shows composition money, or money made, made from publishing, and um, just like a sort of, I'm sort of highlighting it here, um, it comes over time, and some of that money is from stuff that he did years ago. We had the same story with the indie, I'm sorry, with the jazz, the jazz sideman who had composed a soundtrack for something in 2001 and was still getting payments in 2008 and 9. So check out the um, case studies at money.futuremusic.org to see a lot of more detail. We have additional data releases that we've already 
po um, published, and we have a lot more that we're planning to do because we have so much data. And the power of replication. Now, the last note I'll say is that we hope to be able to do this work again because this is a snapshot. It's a benchmarking effort. It's the first time we've tried it. Um, we, we think this is a good starting point. We'd like to do it again in the United States. We'd also think it's a, a model that could be used to, do, to, um, to examine other art forms and be used in other territories to see what it looks like from, in, from different perspectives based on country to country. So thank you so much for your time. And um, there's the website. And um, I know we have to go on to the next, the next panel, but I'm around all today if you'd like to have any other questions. Thank you.